And for our first speaker, we are very honored to have Ms. Eva. She's the managing director of L'Oreal. L'Oreal is the leading company in the beauty industry. And under Eva's leadership, L'Oreal is actively enhancing its local sustainability roadmap and make great impact on the on fighting uh, climate change. And Ms. Eva, you have the floor, please. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my presentation with you. Just one second. Okay. So, good morning, distinguished guests. Good morning to all of you. My name is Eva. I'm the managing director for L'Oreal subsidiary in Taipei. It's my honor to participate in this forum and present to you the L'Oreal for the Future program and how we fight against climate change. For over a century, L'Oreal has been dedicated to only one vocation, creating the beauty. Our goal is to offer each and every person around the world the best of beauty in terms of quality, efficiency, safety, sincerity, and responsibility to satisfy all the beauty needs and desires. We know that beauty is more than just looking good. Beauty is a powerful force that moves us. Our sense of purpose is our North Star that guides our behaviors, actions, decisions every day in our work. L'Oreal will always focus to lead the corporate and social responsibility. So we create, we aim to create the beauty that moves the world. Zhong Zhao Mei Li, Gang Dong Shi Jie. And at L'Oreal, we are committed to preserving our planet's beauty and we act to fight climate change. Our sense of purpose for us is for a sustainable world. As a global leader, we have a strong impact to take real steps and look after the climate. It's our responsibility. Over the last 10 years, we have undertaken an in-depth transformation to reduce our impact across the entire value chain. Since 2013, we launched our first sustainability program. We have totally reinvented the way we design and make our products with sustainability as a fundamental requirement. Every new product and every renovation of the product has to have a better footprint. These sustainability actions have been earned L'Oreal Worldwide Trust as affirmed by numerous awards, both domestic here in the Taipei region and internationally. L'Oreal is the only company to have achieved for six years running a triple A score by governmental nonprofit CDP. So we received an A assessment in climate safety, in sustainable resource management and for forest protection and non forestation. Here, you can see a quote of our new CEO, Mr. Nicola Hieronymus. We must continue to go further and faster to face the world's most pressing environmental challenges. So we launched a new phase of our sustainability journey, L'Oreal for the future. And we want to build our complement to strive and make significant leaps forward. It's not just what we have achieved today, but we must continue in the future. So L'Oreal for the future, puts our creating the beauty that moves the world concept into practice to protect the planet's environment, boost diversity, equity in society, and strive towards a sustainable future. So the L'Oreal for the Future program embodies two complementary dimensions, what corporate responsibility means for us. One, transforming our company towards increasing sustainable business model and two, contributing to solving the challenges facing the world. We have concretely three pillars. Number one is transforming our business to respect the planet's limits. Number two is empowering our ecosystem, helping its transition to a more sustainable world. We believe at L'Oreal, it's our responsibility to involve the consumers, educate them, our suppliers, and the communities we work in with our transformation process and to help them in the transition for a sustain more sustainable world themselves. And number three, contributing to solving challenges of the world by supporting urgent social and environmental needs. L'Oreal therefore is allocating a fund of over 150 million euros to address urgent social and environmental causes. So to step into our international process and ensure our activities are compatible with a resource constrained planet, we have set our 2030 targets. 
on water, biodiversity, natural resources and climate in accordance with the scientific expert demand and what our planet needs. We are accelerating the transformation towards a model of respecting planetary boundaries and reinforcing the commitment to both sustainability and inclusion. We know it's not longer enough for companies to reduce their environmental impact, but with all these objectives that are self-set. Actually, in 2017, L'Oreal was amongst the first 100 companies to set science-based target initiative. All of the group's targets for 2030 were set in accordance with this SBT rationale, which encourages companies to commit to a voluntary transition towards a low carbon economy and establish targets that are in line with the latest climate science says, and to follow the 1.5 degree trajectory. Our commitment is to ensure that all our activities are respectful of what the planet can withstand and defined by environmental science. So what are L'Oreal's concrete targets to managing water sustainability? We have committed for years to ensure contribution to high water quality and sustainable water quantity across the whole value chain. And in 2013, all our strategic suppliers will use water sustainabilities wherever they operate. In 2013, 100% of the water used in our industrial processes will be recycled or reused in a loop in all our factories. Product innovation will play a vital role as well in our efforts to conserve water. By 2030, we will evaluate all our formats thanks to environmental test platform to guarantee that they are respectful of all aquatic ecosystems, whether continental or coastal. Let's look at biodiversity. Preserving the beauty of the planet also means preserving biodiversity. At L'Oreal, we use approximately 1,600 raw materials from nearly 350 different plants. This is why we see that biodiversity is an important and growing source of innovation, and we are committed of sourcing our ingredients in a sustainable and responsible manner. By 2030, 100% of our bio-based ingredients for formulas, packaging materials will be traceable and will come from sustainable sources. None of them will be linked to de deforestation. And by 2030, we are committed that 100% of our industrial sites and all operated buildings will have a positive impact on biodiversity compared to 2019. Here in Taipei, as you can see on this image of the Citizen Day, we are committed to make Taipei a greener city with our biodiversity program. Now let's look at our natural resources. At L'Oreal, we manage the consumption of natural resources to ensure our activities are compatible with a resource constrained planet. By 2030, we are committed that 95% of our ingredients in formulas will be bio-based, derived from abundant minerals or from circular processes. 100% of the plastics used in our packaging will be either from recycled or bio-based sources. And by 2025, we almost are very to 50%. And by 2025, 100% of our plastic packaging will be refillable, reusable, recyclable, or compostable. This is a great effort and every single employee at L'Oreal works towards this. We have set numeral targets for every aspect of our activities that include not only the production and distribution facilities, but also the raw material supply chain and indirect impacts associated with the use of our products. By 2030, our strategic supplies will reduce their direct emissions and in 50% in absolute terms compared to 2016. All of our sites have achieved by 2025 carbon neutrality, improving energy efficiency and using 100% renewable energy. So the question is, what are we doing here? What are we doing here in Taipei? We have been proactively implementing our targets on renewable energy at the L'Oreal subsidiary here. We joined forces with a newly established renewable energy retailer, along with various departments and agencies in the public sector, including the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Bureau of Energy, Thai Power, to successfully transform the company's Taipei 101 office suites, where we are, into the L'Oreal Renewable Energy Model for commercial offices. This is to say, although our office in 101 
has a shared electricity account, the agreements with commercial and government entities allow for the purchase of renewable energy that demonstrates to other enterprises the provision of green energy in a mix of commercial offices. It is possible. Thereby, we can encourage others to follow us, bringing in the promotion of environmental sustainability to the next level. Our success also comes with a combined effort through engaging different stakeholders by working together with the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Bureau of Standards, Energy and Taiwan Energy Transmission Units. So we are very happy and very proud that we have achieved 100% renewable energy sourcing last year. And we can proudly say L'Oreal in Taipei achieved 100% carbon neutrality in 2021. So L'Oreal worldwide has reduced the emissions of its industrial sites by 81% compared to 2005, lowering greenhouse gas emissions on its plants, distribution centers, using renewable energy and improving its energy efficiency. In the same period, the production volume have increased by 29%, which confirms that this is our ability to combine commercial success with a commitment to ambitious climate actions. This is also the way with our growth, how we can finance the way to go. Our strategy is very clear. It is low carbon growth. So taking into account our business beauty, our position as leader and global presence, L'Oreal's contribution can be nothing but major. Our driving force and ambition is a more beautiful future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing. And I think uh, L'Oreal for the future covers all aspects and involves all stakeholders. It's really a complete and ambitious program, and we wish you success on the road to a sustainable future. Thank you. And now we go to the next section of today. Our, uh, and for our participants, uh, you can use the chat box to share your thoughts with our speaker. I think the speaker will be very happy to answer your question in the QA session. Okay. Now we go to the next section today. Our next speaker is Mr. Hidetoshi Mishima. He is the senior chief engineer at Mitsubishi Electric Corporation. And Mr. Hidetoshi is specialized in artificial intelligence and also imaging system. And he has engaged in the construction of the zero energy building which demonstrates the possibility of a low carbon society in the future. Mr. Hidetoshi is going to share with us on Mitsubishi Electric's effort towards zero energy of building space for sustainable society. Mr. Hidetoshi, you have the floor, please. Okay, I will start the presentation. Uh, thank you for participating in this workshop. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be very honored. I would like to introduce the current best practice for decarbonization under this title. Uh, zero energy building is referred to as ZEB in my speech. Stage two is an introduction to Mitsubishi Electric's business and corporate R&D. While strengths uh, the equipment and system business uh, that we have calculated so far. We will provide solutions that uh, integrated all functions inside and outside our group. We are conducting research that uh, contribute to the business of lifestyle, industry, infrastructure, and mobility at six bases on the right figure. I am in the Information Technology R&D Center. Page three uh, is a summary is the Mitsubishi Electric Group Environmental Sustainability Vision uh, 2050. It establishes Mitsubishi Electric's uh, fu uh, future course toward 2050 in the form of the Environmental Declaration. Uh, page three is a summary of Mitsubishi Electric Group's Environmental Sustainability Vision 2050. Uh, it establishes Mitsubishi Group uh, Mitsubishi Electric future course toward 2050 in the form of uh, environmental declarations, three environmental action guidelines, and key activities as shown in the left figure. 
And as shown in the figure at the right, uh, we will enrich people's uh, lives uh, in four business fields, including lifestyles and so on. The fourth page explains uh, uh, materiality, which is the most important issue for uh, the Mitsubishi Electric Group. Uh, with the vision of uh, realizing a vibrant and sustainable society. The Mitsubishi Electric Group uh, has established its materiality by grouping sustainability initiatives that uh, have particular uh, priority from two uh, perspectives, perspective of uh, providing a, social to, um, a solution to social challenge through our business and strengthen uh, our business foundation to enable our sustainable growth. In this chapter, I uh, describe their efforts toward the uh, realization of decarbonized society in Japan. Page six is a, a green growth strategy established mainly uh, by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry of Japan toward uh, 2050. According to this uh, paper, 14 sectors that are expected to grow toward uh, 2050 uh, are selected. Uh, ZEB is listed as number uh, 12. ZEB means zero energy buildings. In this term, uh, it is written that uh, in 2030, uh, the ablation new houses and buildings are Z and Z. In addition, it has set uh, high goals for automobiles, uh, battery and semiconductors, information and communications, uh, aircraft, etc. And the uh, economic uh, effect in uh, 2050. Uh, is about uh, 290 uh, trillion yen. In page graph uh, on page seven, I will explain the background why they attract attention. It shows change uh, in energy consumption and real GDP by sector. Between 1973 and 2019, uh, 19, uh, real GDP increased 2.6 times, and finally energy consumption increased 1.2 times. The industrial sector amount for the largest proportion, but the uh, commercial sector, which is uh, the area of buildings, uh, has the highest growth rate. In other words, the meaning of ZEB is two suppressed uh, this largest growth. In page eight, uh, I will explain the definition of ZEP in Japan. With significant energy saving and renewable energy in buildings, we reduce uh, annual primary energy consumption bar uh, balance to even. Uh, energy creation is limited to equipment on the closed on site. This is a big challenge. Uh, there are five energy saving equipment, air conditioning, ventilation, lighting, hot water supply, and elevators. Outlets to uh, which oil equipment, et cetera, are connected are ex uh, excluded. By definition, uh, is not allowed to reduce the balance to zero by using only renewable energy without saving energy. Page uh, nine shows that ZEB is uh, defined and classified into four types according to the degree of achievement of energy reduction rate in the uh, design phase of the building. The highest level of Z is on the far right uh, in the figure. The Z uh, 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 with the highest energy reduction rate is uh, italicized and bracketed. When I speak, uh, I it called net Z. Net Z means 
energy saving of more than 100% uh, in total energy saving and energy generation. Page 10, uh, in, in this chapter, uh, I dis uh, describe our net zero effort. Page 11 provides an overview of our net zero challenge. The name of building is SASTI. Completed in October 2020, uh, researchers and staff members have been working in it for more than one year. Uh, Mitsubishi Electric contributed to the uh, design as a ZEV planner. Uh, our members accelerate the development and tests of ZEV related technologies and contribute to the uh, realization of more energy saving and comfortable office uh, at the same time. The building has been uh, certified for net ZEV and Chasby Wellness uh, Office as shown in the lower right corner of the figure. This first best practice in our net zip. The second best practice is a comfortable walking. Uh, I will use page 12 to tell you a little more. As a building, it is a medium-sized building that is a volume zone and a net zip. And uh, the floor uh, area exceeds uh, 5,000 square meters. According to our survey, uh, conventional net zeb has uh, been so far achieved only uh, for the buildings less than half the size. And all solar panels are only uh, installed on the building. This is sustainable for urban areas. In addition, we have in, uh, incorporated interior design with uh, a view of uh, no no uh, with a view to uh, obtain well certification uh, in pursuit of comfort and health uh, for ease of working. Page 13 describes uh, the equipment and uh, systems that can be uh, applied to Z. The five uh, facilities required for the uh, VEMS and other products are uh, abundantly available. In addition, uh, we have uh, developed the building uh, simulation technologies as shown in the figure light. Uh, while using energy saving facilities such as uh, uh, page starting, uh, the uh, energy con uh, consumption of these uh, facilities will make the most of renewable energy from solar panels and the light. The solar panels that uh, cover the entire rooftop and the eaves on each uh, floor uh, use, uh, use an, uh, natural energy from the sun, uh, as shown in the capture on the light. Uh, natural wind also blows through automatic ventilation windows, as shown in the figure uh, at the bottom right. Uh, this is used to contribute to saving energy in the middle season, such as spring and autumn. Page 15 describes the third best practice that uh, has been uh, implemented one, uh, in one year, uh, since SASTIA was completed. While controlling energy from the control room, uh, we experimentally confirmed the operation as net zero. As far as uh, we investigated, we succeeded uh, in confirming it the, uh, for the first time in Japan. Zep operation technology bring the uh, annual energy balance to minus 155%, uh, no, 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 15% uh, uh, compared to the standard buildings. As shown in the graph on the light, this operating technology also uses AI. In order not only to make a building uh, more, a more uh, valuable space for economic activities 
uh, but also to contribute to, to uh, the realization of a uh, uh, more decarbonization society. Uh, we, we will summarize the candidate for uh, development from uh, next page. SASTIA is a space to test various technologies. The office uh, can be tested in independently as shown in the picture on the right, middle row. Uh, in addition, to make it easier to replace the facilities, we try to be uh, able to concent uh, concentrate on the balcony, as shown in the photo uh, at the bottom right. In future tests, we will make effective use of these building infrastructures. We will determine the uh, value required of first uh, future building, such as BCP, resilience, and accelerate development uh, through a test experiment uh, for the following technologies as a candidate for the next world challenges. First, uh, technology development to enhance the application of building to climate change uh, including uh, severe disasters. Second, uh, technology development that contribute to collab uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation between multiple, uh, multiple buildings and other systems, such as town and electric power system, including people on uh, their ac uh, activities uh, related of them, uh, to them, including the use of renewable energy certification. So, uh, technology development uh, corresponding to the new normal uh, work side. As mentioned in the various page, the building can trade uh, electric uh, electricity in conjunction with other systems, uh, such as a power system, and will be able to procure more, procure more uh, renewable energy. For example, mega solar and wind farms. We believe that uh, this uh, will require the examination of following social uh, platforms. A platform that uh, automatically adjusts and ex uh, execute uh, power adjustment based on the uh, registration agreement between power uh, company in a renewable energy certified power market transaction. Mobility is uh, electric. Mobility is uh, elected and uh, uh, mobility is electrified. Uh, move between building, considering the use uh, use case, including this. It is uh, possible to try following uh, technologies. Uh, technology for execute peer-to-peer -peer surplus power transaction by controlling uh, virtual current uh, currencies and bonds on the blockchain network with renewable energy certification. As mentioned in page 17, uh, Mitsubishi Electric will contribute to the realization of uh, net zero 2050 including the spread of net zero energy buildings as a highly efficient equipment and system manufacturer after demonstrating uh, such technology in the future. That's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to my poor English speech. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hidetoshi. I think indeed achieving carbon neutral requires innovation of many related technology, and we are really excited to see the technical progress that Mitsubishi Electric has made. And for the participants, if you have any question about the presentation from Mr. Hidetoshi, uh, please use the chat box to share your comments with our speaker. Thank you. Okay, now we go to the next section of this webinar, and we're also very honored to have uh, Ms. Jennifer Martin, she's the Executive Director of Center for Resource Solutions, CRS. And CRS is a non-governmental organization that creates policy and market solutions to advance renewable energy. And Ms. Jennifer has very long experience in, 
experience in uh, energy policy and also market developments. The topic she is going to share with us is best practices and lessons for renewable energy procurement. And Ms. Jennifer, you have the floor, please. Thank you. I'll just take a moment here to share my presentation. Good. I hope that's working for everybody. Yes, we can see it. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to join you here today. Um, I want to thank MOEA and BSMI and the T-Rex Center for hosting this event. I think it's a very important um, topic for us to be convening on in a regional aspect. Um, just briefly about the Center for Resource Solutions, uh, we're a non-governmental organization focused on creating policy and market solutions to advance sustainable energy since 1997. Our work uh, falls into sort of three main categories. Uh, we work on developing policies, market mechanisms, and providing expert assistance um, to stakeholders in the industry as well as governments and regulators. Um, we also have a new program called the Clean Energy Accounting Project, which is um, developing best practices to address greenhouse gas accounting issues and questions in the clean energy space. As part of our market development work, for over 20 years, CRS has been providing technical assistance so, to support the planning and development of tracking systems, serving regulatory and voluntary green power markets, both in the U.S. as well as in Latin America and in Asia. It's um, renewable energy certificates and tracking renewable energy certificates is a very important part of growing renewable energy markets. And we applaud the ongoing work here and among all your attendees and workshop speakers uh, to support and improve these systems. In addition, uh, CRS runs a variety of educational programs from webinars to developing best practices papers and conferences. And we also administer the Greeny certification program, which provides assurances to suppliers of user and users of renewable energy, that'd be electricity and renewable fuels, as well as carbon offsets. And I'll speak more about those programs later in my presentation. Today, I wanted to focus on uh, four main topics. Um, one is just to brief, briefly recap the role of RECs or energy attribute certificates and renewable energy procurement. And then to talk a little bit about um, buyer preferences and how RECs and REC tracking fit into that. I'd also like to speak briefly about um, the policy environment, uh, regulatory environment in which voluntary renewable energy procurement occurs and what governments and economies can do to support buyer demand uh, through the regulatory process. And then finally, um, talk about third party certification and how that interacts with REC and REC systems. So as for those of you who've been participating in the workshops the last three days, um, we had many speakers talk about the role of renewable energy certificates and what high quality REC tracking systems do. It's important um, to focus on having REC systems um, that document renewable energy usage and procurement with legitimate and high quality renewable energy certificates or EACs. You know, as we've heard from many speakers, RECs are an accounting tool to demonstrate um, that each unique megawatt hour or kilowatt hour is accurately measured, recorded and tracked, and that usage is documented through cancellation or retirement. Um, I underline two words here, legitimate and high quality, and I just want to speak about that a little bit more. Um, RECs are increasingly being viewed as assets, not only by sellers, that is the generators or energy suppliers who own generators, but by buyers as well. So establishing a sound legal and contractual framework that supports ownership of these assets and claims based on them increases their value and efficacy as a tool to support renewable energy development and renewable energy usage claims. Um, the more confidence that buyers have in RECs and the REC systems that are being put in place across the different economies, the more likely they will be able to trans transact in those systems and the more value they'll be able to put in them as part of their overall environmental goals. 
So sort of switching to the perspective of buyers. Um, buyers have a lot of reasons why they engage with renewable energy. Um, each company has its own goals and metrics for renewable energy procurement. And all of these, you know, all of these goals are underscored with the use of RECs, but they often require more than that. RECs on their own are not enough to achieve a lot of the goals that companies have for their renewable energy procurement. They might be doing it for scope to reporting to lower their overall environmental footprint. Um, they might want to support new clean energy project development. Um, they might be using their procurement to communicate their overall environmental commitment as a company. Um, they also might be buying renewable energy to reduce their long term electricity procurement costs or to reduce price risks that they'll be subject to in the future in the markets. More and more companies are talking about the social impact of their renewable energy procurement as an important criteria in their decision making. And they also do it to demonstrate leadership and to show that they're making a difference, that the investments that they're making in renewable energy are beyond what's required by law and helping us to achieve our climate goals at a faster pace. So when you think about all of these ways that companies um, are looking at the renewable energy procurement, it's not surprising that in the more um, well-developed voluntary markets, there are a variety of products that are available to buyers. So I'm going to use the U.S. as a case study here. Um, these two charts show you sort of the diversity of product types that are available to buyers from the very largest companies in the market to individual consumers who might be looking to buy renewable energy for their homes or apartments. Um, the first chart on the left um, shows you the percent of sales by product type. So as you can see, unbundled RECs, that big dark blue band in the middle, remain um, a popular way to purchase renewable energy. Many large corporations use unbundled RECs as one of the primary tools in which they buy renewable energy. And when I say unbundled, I mean RECs sold um, without accompanying electricity. Um, but there are a variety of other ways that companies and individuals are buying renewables. That top light blue section, power purchase agreements, and also included that are virtual power purchase agreements, are growing in popularity among the largest companies and buyers of renewable energy. And these are often um, bundled procurement. They're not just buying RECs, they're buying long-term renewable electricity contracts where they're relying on this electricity procurement is part of the way that they're powering their operations. Um, CCAs are community choice aggregators. Um, it's a type of retailer that's allowed in some sections of the United States where um, a community like a city or a county can act as a retailer on behalf of their residents and businesses and contract for usually renewable electricity from generators to provide electricity and RECs to their consumers. In places with retail competition, we see competitive suppliers or load serving entities offering a variety of green power products to consumers. And then utilities are also developing a variety of different products they offer um, from traditional utility green pricing, where the utility may offer an option to all their customers to pay a little more in order to receive green power to specialized utility contracts where the utility is essentially offering large buyers the equivalent of a PPA that the utility arranges for them. Um, what's important to um, remember about all of this is that companies have different goals in how they want to procure, and allowing more purchasing options will enable more companies and attract more companies to participate in the market. The policy environment um, that exists within the economy also has a lot of impact on the attractiveness of RECs and renewable energy products to corporate buyers. Many different policies can interact with um, the renewable energy and the electricity industry and can have impacts on claims um, on the clarity of ownership of renewable energy attributes. Um, I think a good example from the APEC region are feed-in tariffs, um, for example. There are a few ex um, economies in the region 
where feed-in tariffs have existed that have created either economic or double counting disincentives for voluntary procurement. I think this is an issue that has become um, much more forefront in the attention of regulators and governments are moving to try to create market environments where feed-in tariffs and voluntary procurement can both exist. And you can see from um, the graphic here, there are a lot of different types of policies that interact um, with the incentives for new renewable energy development. Um, corporate and voluntary procurement and RECs are one of those. In order to create market environment that encourages um, buyer demand, it's just really important to think about having clear accounting and claims practices. So having a strong REC tracking system um, and clarity on policy interactions from the government and key stakeholders really enhances market outcomes and effectiveness and helps um, drive buyer engagement. I'd like to um, switch topics a little bit now and talk about the Greeny certification program. Um, just before I start, I wanna do a little clarity on, on terminology. So we've been using all throughout the workshop, the term certificate and certification. So for this part of my presentation, I wanna use the word certification to re refer to a program or programs that have a standard or a rule set against which activities can be measured and verified. So for the Greeny programs, we offer um, a certification program that has an underlying standard. Um, companies, both buyers and sellers can participate in the program and then they're subject to marketing oversight and verification to assure that they're meeting the requirements of the standard. Um, the Greeny standard is a program that layers on top of REC systems. So RECs and REC tracking systems are an essential component um, to what Greeny offers buyers, but Greeny has additional criteria um, that address eligibility of supply. For example, what types of renewable resources are eligible, um, and that they are relatively recently um, constructed. Uh, Greeny requires regulatory surplus, um, exclusive delivery and ownership of certificates and no double claiming or double counting. Um, we have disclosure requirements. We oversee marketing and claims um, by companies that participate in the program. And in the US, we currently have close to 1.5 million retail purchasers of Greeny certified products. Um, including over 100,000 businesses. Greeny is the largest established certification program of its type and is now operating both in not only in the US, but also in Canada, Chile, Singapore, and Chinese Taipei. And we're in the process of expanding the program to other markets as well. Uh, this chart gives a uh, graphical summary of the growth of the Greeny certification program for renewable energy over the last number of years. Greeny is referenced by quite a few other um, programs and organizations that promote green energy usage. The reason um, Greeny is popular um, and endorsed by a lot of these other groups is because the program provides a link between tracking and accounting, which is what REC systems offer, and impact and claims, as well as risk reduction, which is what buyers are seeking. Greeny also allows buyers to certify their renewable energy usage. Um, there's many examples of companies um, that choose to label products as made with renewable energy. Um, there's a lot of reasons they do this, and on this um, slide, you'll see some examples of products that are currently um, using the Greeny logo to communicate that they were made with renewable energy um, to their buyers. There's a lot of reasons companies will do this. Um, sometimes they do it because they know the consumers of their products care about this. Um, they have internal stakeholders, and they want to rely on an independent, trusted third party to validate their public claims about their environmental commitment. 
Just one last word about certification programs. Well, you know, Greeny is one of the most well known names. There are other programs out there in other economies, often called green labels. And I think they all, you know, provide a lot of the same assurances, which is that you have an independent third party, you know, who's working with either renewable energy sellers or buyers to add legitimacy to what they're doing and including, you know, recommending that the products that they're certifying meet certain criteria and attributes that buyers may desire. Um, just to sum up a few of the key points to get across about how you can develop strong renewable energy markets. Um, one, which is one that's been a major topic of the presentation so far is um, real delivery of specified generation or renewable energy attributes. So this is, this is going back to the need to have strong rec systems that really, you know, are backed up with the force of law and contract that you are transacting, you know, unique ownership claims to renewable energy and the environmental attributes it creates. Um, the second one is consumer confidence. Again, not just in the REC systems, but in the whole system of buying and selling renewable energy. Um, this is a, a point down below, but government and um, NGOs have a really important role to play here. Um, government programs and NGOs can add confidence to the market through recognition um, and setting out guidance. Um, to encourage participation by companies and individuals in the voluntary market. Of course, no double counting and no double claiming are essential um, to create confidence in the market. And again, strong REC systems um, provide a lot of the basis for that. And then, as I said before, um, ongoing interaction with the regulatory structure. Um, it's important, especially now as countries double down on their climate commitments, um, to think about how regulatory structures and new policies that are coming out at the governmental level impact um, the claims and tradability of renewable energy within each economy. Um, and then finally, if I were to leave you with one um, main message is that renewable energy products really need to meet um, customer preferences and needs. So the creation of renewable energy certificates and tracking systems is an essential foundation but it's not all that's needed to be able to create renewable energy products that meet um, the desires and goals of corporate buyers. Um, before I say um, goodbye to you today, I did want to bring your attention um, to another event um, that we're organizing, Renewable Energy Markets Asia. This is the second year that we have offered this conference. Um, it's really a good place to go for follow on discussions uh, for many of the topics that you've heard about today in this workshop. It's going to be held online um, April 26th to 28th um, in daytime hours for the Asia audience. Um, and we invite all the participants to um, please check it out. Um, we also have our long running renewable energy markets conference in the US, which has been jointly presented with the US Environmental Protection Agency for over 20 years, and that will be held in person in Minneapolis in September. So I sincerely hope that you will be able to participate in one or both of those conferences. Um, and I'd be happy um, to engage with any of you after the event. So here is my contact information. And again, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate today.